You are listening to The Jam Price Show all about movies. And today my guest is Oscar-nominated editor, Kevin Tent. And Kevin was on my show. We were just discussing this about six years ago. So it's, welcome back to the show, Kevin. Thanks, Jan. Thanks for having me again. It's oh, my pleasure. Oh, my pleasure to have you back. I Our interview that we did six years ago was wonderful. So I always thought I'd love to have you back on the show uh, with another project in the future. So I'm happy to be talking about this project, The Holdovers. Uh, you know, recently at the Santa Barbara International Film Festival, uh, Kevin, uh, Kevin, Andrew Payne, uh, Alexander Payne. Alexander, yeah. That's right. Alexander Payne and... Um, Screenwriter uh, David Hemmingson and actor Dominic Sessa all came and they had a special screening at the Riviera Theater, which is in Santa Barbara. It's a wonderful theater. Beautiful place. Uh, yeah. yeah, it is. The, the film festival purchased a number of years ago and uh, raised the funds to renovate it. And it's just uh, a, a little treasure here in, in Santa Barbara. It and is. so he did this special screening, sold out sold out screening um, to see this film on a Sunday morning at 1030 in the morning. Wow, and that's impressive. Very impressive. And uh, the interview was amazing. But people loved, loved, loved this movie. And wow. unfortunately, when I went to see it, I, I know I always have tissues, but for some reason I didn't have tissues. And I was crying throughout this film. <laughs> I was like, darn, of all times not to have any tissue. So I absolutely love this film. Uh, I really do. And I, I actually said to Christine, the publicist from Fo is it Focus Features, I believe, right? That's yeah, yes, different. Focus, yeah. Uh, I said, this, I think this becomes a Christmas classic that um, people need to watch every single year. because that would be If that happens, that would be amazing. That yeah. would be great. It has that great. feel. It has that feel of a, it's a wonderful life kind of feel to it. So right. please tell uh, Alexander that because I, I just. Oh, I, he would I, love that. He loves Frank Capra and he loves that that movie and other Frank movies. He's a huge fan of his. So me uh, too. Me too. I'm a huge fan of Frank Capra. So let's talk about you and your career. I mean, we, we've talked about your career in our last uh, interview, but I want to talk more about this film itself because it is so different from um, the type of film that Alexander has done in the past and in, in the way that he, this is set in 1970 and he makes it feel like a film that was filmed in 1970. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about that and how for you as an editor, what you had to do also to make this have this like, incredible, it really does have this old style feel to it feel, yeah well you know there's a couple things we did some you know editorial tricks and kind of things to visually make it feel that way and you know some of the um stylistic choices we made with dissolves and that kind of thing did that but it's funny you mentioned that because we had a q a with alexander i was with him a, you know a few weeks ago on one and and um people were saying oh you know it was like a 70s film and and but and then we we said, you know, he always kind of makes 70s films. Even his early films are really kind of like 70s films. They're, and we approached it the same way, besides doing the editorial tricks I just mentioned. We approached it the same way we approached all his, have approached all his movies, which is we're very performance driven and, uh, you know, uh, in our editorial choices. And so, yeah, it's like, it's more unique and more seventies than maybe his other films, but his other films have also been very kind of seventies, like, like mm -hmm. about Schmidt, let's say, or, you know, citizen Ruth or uh, even, even sideways, I would say. Yeah. 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 I just had the, um, a, a group here just uh, that I belong to. Uh, they were bringing in the two owners of um, the hitching, hitching post. Oh Yeah. They were supposed to come and 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 talk to us about sideways, and they uh, unfortunately couldn't come in person. But we did a Zoom meeting with them, and they went on and on and on. And then we saw sideways again, which I had not seen in quite a while. But now that I live in the close by the area, uh, of right? Sideways was filmed. It was fascinating to hear what they had to say and how that all came about. It was really, really wonderful discussion about that film, which is coming up to its 20th anniversary. I which think is I so that. crazy. That just, you know, it's like one of those things you just can't believe that it's, you know, it's hard to believe. It's really, it's really 
hard to believe that's 20 years. It is. And I heard that there's going to be a, a probably Alexander, I think I read in somewhere that he said there's probably going to be a lot more interviews and and retrospectives about this film since it's coming up to 20 years. Have you yeah. heard about that? Uh, no, I haven't heard about that, but we are doing something uh, in a couple of weeks. We're going to do a Q&A. Alexander and I are, are about, oh, sorry, on one second. Uh, a Q and A with um, about sideways. Uh, it's a virtual thing that we're doing, and about the editing of it and stuff. So that'll be fun. But yeah, we the the all the winemakers were so kind to us at the ten year reunion. So I'm hoping they're going to be kind to us again on the twentieth because they threw a great party. Like for we had really great food, and it was like fundraisers for some other things that were going on in um, in uh, your area, Santa Barbara, and stuff. But uh, yeah, so I'm hoping that that happens again because it was really fun. We had a weekend of drinking wine and eating great food. It was really fun. What could be better than that? Nothing. Nothing could be better. <laughs> and people better. going, your movie was great. You know, you got to love that. The whole thing yeah. was terrific. Yeah, so hopefully. <laughs> it is. It's a classic. It's another classic. It's one that people talk about all the time. And it's, yeah. a, you know, it comes up in conversations a lot. It's, you know, for some people for their top, some of their favorite movies ever. Yeah. Sideways, uh, for sure, for sure. But let's get back to the holdovers because- yeah. What was different? I mean, yes, maybe he approaches his movies in the seventies, you know, stop, you know, way of how he makes his movies. But this one really has the feel of nineteen, right. you know, the yeah. the whole um, the set design, the cinematography, all of it just had this wonderful feel. And by the way, congratulations, um, because. Th- the Indie Spirit Awards just nominated uh, Dominic Sessa as Best oh. Supporting Actor, uh, the screenwriter David Hemings, Hemings' right. son. Uh, the now I'm going to mess up this name. Well, also Divine Joy uh, Randolph, Randolph. Best oh, Supporting Actress, but the cinematographer. And I'm going to I don't want to mess up the ex, uh, the Igel 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 Bird. Berg Igel Berg was also nominated for an Independent Spirit Award, but right before I went on to interview you the national board of review just gave paul giamatti the best actor nice yes and That's wonderful i didn't know that and That's divine great. joy randolph got best supporting actress great so you- well they're all terrific in the movie i mean they're so good uh, that's great news. I, I I hadn't heard that. So yeah, well, good. I'm presenting the news to you right off the hot hot off the presses. For that's so exciting. That's great. Well, it that is. sounds fantastic. Yeah, and I think this movie is going to be headed to for more awards as we go into the uh, awards well, season here. From your lips to God's ears, we'll see what happens. <laughs> but yeah, you know, you never know. You never know. But it's been wonderful how how it's been received. You hope when you're working on it, you know, I felt pretty good about it. Even watching dailies, I was like, we got some solid scenes here. Um, and Paul, I knew right off the bat was just nailing it. And, uh, oh, but we- you just never know, you know, we, you're, you keep on working and you never know how it's going to be received really. So, but I, I, I was confident and sometimes I'm not confident. So, but I was confident on this one early on. And what made you confident about this one early on to Kevin? Well, you mentioned the cinematography. I knew right away it looked beautiful. And this, you know, the the locations they got were amazing. And the production design is just, it's very rich and warm and feels like the East Coast and feels, yeah. yes. you know, a little old, I guess, too, just the locations. And, uh, and I knew right away that the performances were good. I, you know, and I knew we were going to shape them more uh, in the editing room, but we were getting, we were given outstanding raw materials to work with from the actors and from Alexander. And uh, so, you know, it was, uh, I just felt very good about it. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm from the East coast and I was there in the 1970s. So um, I I can totally relate to it too. How does the audience get involved with the characters through editing? You you mentioned the acting. So how does that, and because I think we might've just talked about this, but I've, I read about this a long time ago that, you know, a true, the acting really is created in the editing room. Now, do you feel that way that you are being the master of someone's performance? I wouldn't say that. Sometimes, yes, you, sometimes you can really help a performance by, you know, judiciously choosing what is seen and what is not seen and and that kind of thing. But um, again, I, I, I just said it, that we got so many 
gems from our cast, even on from the set. I mean, they were really, Paul, I can't say enough wonderful things about him because he was just nailed it. Like, and, and he has some real tongue twisters to say, and he says them fast in the movie. Um, but he rarely had to go back and pick one up and, you know, you know, or he'd want to go back and get another version of something. He rarely went back on his, for him to get something new. Um, and uh, this just goes to show you how locked he locked in. He was with the, with the character and stuff. So um, yeah. So it was yeah. for him. I mean, it's a perfect, well, he's always wonderful in whatever he does, but this yeah. is a perfect role. I have to tell you last night I was standing in line again to go to the Riviera theater for a special screening of the film with uh, Ava DuVernay's film. Oh, oh yeah. Right. Right. Oh my God. Amazing film. But yeah. You know, uh, and uh I was standing in line talking to these women and we started talking about the holdovers and they were quoting lines for the film to me. <laughs> they really? Yes. See? That's a good, that's a great sign. That's wonderful. Okay. We love that. Well, I was like shocked. I was like, they were quoting me different lines. And I thought, wow, that's do They, and they just loved the film. So that was oh, nice to, you to stand in line. I said, I'm going to be interviewing uh, the editor. <laughs> Kevin. And she said, tomorrow. who's that? <laughs> <laughs> What do they do? <laughs> right. What does an editor do? Right? Yeah. It only makes the film the film <laughs> that it is. Well, so yeah. with you, you know, this I want to talk a little bit about um how do you make it feel totally real in the editing room? Um, I would say what we do and what Alexander and I I think we strive for, everything really becomes believable with the performances like I think that's really the audience buys in when they believe a character and they empathize and sympathize and sort of I don't want to say become the character but but tap into what the character is doing and we do everything we can to make sure that everything is convincing and um and that uh you know there's nothing that takes them out of being uh united with the character I don't know if that made any sense, but that was that's what we kind of strive to do. And it's really our taste of what we think is believable or not believable. And then we make adjustments always to see if we can fine tune a performance so that, uh, you know, an audience is very engaged and they don't lose their engagement. Right. So right. Uh, um, hopefully it made that. Jan, I hope that made some sense. I just really <laughs> hope so. So. <laughs> Oh, well, I think it did. I think it, okay. does, it does. It does, Kevin. It's really hard to describe what editing, you know, how editing works. Because you do so many small things all the time that hopefully add up to, you know, making a movie believable and convincing and engaging. And and I think we talked last time a little bit about your process with Alexander. And you've worked with other many wonderful directors. So yes. um, besides Alexander, but it, you're, is it the same process that you kind of start the edit? It, tell me a little bit about that process. Tell our audience. Yeah. So well, we work process. differently than than traditionally how, but it's a it's a way we've sort of evolved over the years. And so he shoots during the day and I get the dailies and I start cutting right away. And he doesn't watch dailies anymore. And the old in the old days, not even that long ago, edit, uh, directors would watch their dailies and everyone would watch their dailies from the the day before that they shot. And um, and give notes and stuff like that. Well, he doesn't do that anymore. He doesn't watch things. He wants to have a little distance from when he shot things and when he comes back to the cutting room and sees it fresh, you know, two, three months later. So I go through and I make a cut of the movie as they're shooting. And then shortly, you know, a week or so after they're done shooting, I'll have a very rough cut of the movie. It's usually, you know, not very pretty. Um, and uh, And then he'll come back to the cutting room and we used to watch my assembly and then we'd start working off of it, but um, he found that too painful. So, so <laughs> now we, uh, we basically start our own editors cut slash directors cut together. We go through dailies, we start picking our takes and putting it roughly together. So it's not as bad as an editor's cut and it's not as good as a director's cut it's kind of an in-between first stage and then we go back and start honing it from there and going through and fine-tuning the movie and we just make a pass at the movie go back make another pass at the movie 
and keep doing that. And then we start screening it for people. When he starts feeling confident, you know, a lot of times he'll show just a couple of reels just to see how it feels to people. And then, you know, after a few, few weeks, a few passes of the movie, then we'll start showing it, the whole thing to, to friends and family and, and that kind of thing and get feedback. So it, how long was the editing process for the holdovers? Um, they shot, they start shooting at the end of January of 2022. And we, we were pretty much done we, you know, we're mixing and all the fine tuning and stuff like that, that takes like, and it's slow and there's visual effects and everything like that. But we were basically done cutting, I would say, you know, in October, no, early November of last year. So I don't know about, I guess, nine, 10 months, something like that. And then the finishing takes another month or so to do. Was there a so, reason you decided to wait? They wait, waited so long to, to release the film? Well, that was Focus's call. I, I During the summer when we were cutting, I was I was like, we should try to get it out this year. I thought we could, but Alexander wasn't in any rush to do it. And I think he was just, you know, he just wasn't in what didn't want to rush it. Right. Um, so we didn't, we didn't push the cut to finish the cut earlier or anything like that. But when focus bought it at Toronto last year, they already had a couple of movies on their slate that they were uh, already in the works promoting. And I, and they were, I, they totally know what they're doing mm-hmm. so much better than I do. Because yeah. I was like, yeah, it should come out. That, you know, let's get it out this year. Um, well, I guess maybe all for my own selfish reasons, because I wanted people to see it. But they were correct. And they were like, no, we'll sit on it. Um, we'll bring it out next year. And as they said, they'll have enough runway to really launch it properly. Right. And they were so right. They've done, I think they've done a great job on it, on releasing it so far. Yeah, so. they have. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Well, they're a great company. I do. They are, and they're really talented, and, yeah. and their people are wonderful. So, yeah, I think they're doing a fantastic job. Yeah, I've I've highlighted lots of their movies on this show through the years. So, yeah, they've right. done a good job. Let's talk about the music. Yeah. You know how do, and you know how do you do the musical transitions, and how does that enhance the performances? The performances, but also the film. And how do you, how does that work for you? How do you who chooses the music? Of course, you have a composer and all of that. But um, right. how does that all work together? Well, when uh, when I'm cutting, when I in the very beginning, when I'm cutting scenes and stuff, I sometimes will have music in my head that I'll go, oh, this would work in this scene or this would work in this scene. This movie, I couldn't hear it in my own head. I was like, I don't know what the music is right here. So a lot of times, except for like rock songs and, you know, source cues that would go in scenes, I was not really sure what what to use. Our longtime assistant editor, Mindy Elliott, who got an associate editor's credit on the movie and deservedly so, mm-hmm. she uh, imported some of the Swingle Singers music, which is the choir Christmas music. Uh-huh. She imported it and either she gave it to me or she cut it into a scene. And that was the first thing we're like, oh, Christmas music. Of course, it's a Christmas music a movie. Um, that seems appropriate, you know? Um, So we started winding up using more and more of that as one bit of the music that we had in the movie. Mm -hmm. Um, And it became ironic at times, um, funny at times, moving at times. It was kind of terrific. It's a, it was wonderful to to work with. Um, And then the other element we had was the other source cues, which is the sixties. That's a whole long story. And, it, and everyone kind of probably knows about that. It gets really expensive. And then you have to, you fall in love with one and then you can't keep it. Um, the score was something that came later. And we have also have a, an amazing music editor we work with named Richard Ford and Mark Orton, the composer, we had worked with him before in Nebraska and um, Richard got us, you know, cut in temp cues that he thought would might work well in scenes and stuff like that and to see if it was the right sound. And Alexander took a long time to really decide who would be the right composer for it. But eventually it landed on Mark Gordon's lap. And Richard had done a lot of prep work with temp tracks and stuff like that. And then that became our our third leg of the tripod of music, I guess you could say. Um, we had the Christmas music, the source cues, and then Mark Gordon's score. So, and you know, the score works beautifully. It's, I think it's kind of reserved and um, quiet and 
let's doesn't overwhelm the emotion just kind of gets in there and helps out and beautiful job I think yeah it really, it, it is. It's very much. It, it, sometimes the music can overpower a film, yeah. or 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 there isn't enough sometimes too. So this was, you know, really was uh, beautifully done and be- beautifully integrated in this film uh, when you're watching it for sure. When when you approach mm-hmm. a new film or a new project, uh, do you approach each one differently, or do you have a set way of how you're going to approach a, a certain film? Um, no, I think I just, uh, you know, I think I'm, I'm pretty probably much like any other editor. The footage comes in and you just look at it and you go, well, I guess I should do this. And you start cutting and you don't really think about it. I don't think, you know, it's not like you read the script and go, well, maybe, no, maybe that's not true. Maybe you read the script and go, oh, okay. These are going to be action scenes. So you're going to watch it with that in mind or something like that. But but most of the time, I think the footage comes in and it kind of dictates how you're going to approach it and how you're going to cut it in, in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. So it's not mm-hmm. it's not like you're dictating it. It's kind of telling you, you know, what you should do. Or there's maybe a combo of both those things happening. And how projects come to you? Do, you? do you get to read the scripts and decide whether this is a film you want to edit or how does that, how does that process well, work? I have an agent who's always kind of out there, you know, looking for the next thing. So um, yeah, people will say, Hey, you know, sometimes it's people I've worked with before. I've got this project coming up. Um, you know, you would, would you be interested in, you know, <clears throat> read the script. And if it seems like a good, fit um you know join forces on it so but it's it's always you never know where a project's going to come from and they pop up you know from odd places sometimes and you never know what you're gonna and sometimes you know if you're doing like a recut or something like that you'll they'll just land in your lap suddenly and you take a look at them and you know if if you think you can work on it and make it better or help out on it then you you go for it and you've been doing this a long time. So I have. Yeah. It's so funny. I feel like I'm becoming one of those old timers. I guess I, I guess I am. <laughs> You're not that old, Kevin. But, I know. Thank you. Thank but you, you have, but you have had quite the illustrious career. You really, really have. I mean, you started with uh, Alexander Payne's son get dance hit Citizen Ruth starring Laura Dern and then Election with Reese Witherspoon. And then, you know, you, you got nominations for many of these films and, you know, Ace, uh, you know, the Ace nomination and, you know, about Schmidt and Sideways and it goes on and on. And then you also um, and, you know, we have downsizing and then and now this one, but you've also been uh, you were elected as the president of the America Cinema Editors. Uh, not once, but twice. And that th- those are those are wonderful uh, uh, tributes to you and your talent wow. and what you wow. do, because I, you don't get that very easily. You know, thank you. Of, yeah. Well, yes, I thought the editors were crazy for electing me. But uh, so far, <laughs> I haven't been impeached yet, which is I'm, I'm very grateful for that. So that's a good thing. That's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the jury's still out. I have a, a year left on my second term. So uh, we'll see well, what you, happens. Never, you never know. You never yeah. know. You never know. What's the thing that you love most about editing? Oh, I think that's a good question. There's well, I don't know. I'm I'm sure this happens to other editors. But when you get into the zone and you're just cutting and you're just like, and your brain's just going fast and, you know, and, and time will fly by and you're like, oh, my God, that was that was an hour, you know, and you didn't even notice it. That's great. And I guess really one of the best things, though, is, is is what's happening with the holdovers right now, where you you work hard on a project and, you know, it gets out there and people are digging it and they are responding how you kind of hope they would, you know. Um, and so many times the exact opposite happens. You work so hard on something and you're like, this is so great. And then no one either sees it or it doesn't land the same way you hoped. And uh, so. One of the great things I think is when you work on something that you really believe in and you worked hard on it and it gets well received. Mm-hmm. I think that's probably the best thing. Well, you've got a great film here with the holdovers that oh, it is, I know it's out right now in theaters only, which I think is the way movies should be seen, as I have said. You know, uh, right. you know throughout this show for many years. 
Uh, so I wish you much success. Maybe we'll be hearing your name for the nominations for uh, Best Editor this year. Well, you never know. I don't know. There's a lot of great editing out there, especially this year. So but you're one of them, Kevin. Wow. <laughs> so, Thanks, Jen. Thank, thank you. you for being on the show again. I really my pleasure coming back on, and I look forward to having you back on with your next project. I'll be there. All right. Take care. All right. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. 